Hi everyone and um, welcome to chapter three. So in this video I will go through um, chapter three lecture notes. As always you can find everything on D2L and again I'm just going to remind you that my slides are slightly different from yours um, but um, in terms of the important concepts, definitions, and graphs are exactly the same, but I might have some examples that you might not find in the lecture notes. So you can take notes if you want, um, or you can just pause the video and, um, and think about it. All right, so this chapter is very, very important. It's common between micro and macro, and probably one thing that you heard a lot about um, in economics, um, basically, which is about demand and supply. Before we talk about demand and supply, let's start with uh, what we mean by market. Um, you're all familiar with market, with um, online markets um, or um, traditional or, or physical market, um, like Amazon, eBay, um, almost all the stores right now, um, they all have, most of them, I should say, um, they have a traditional kind of store um, and they have online store. Um, so when we say, let's say HEB, it's a traditional store because you can walk, uh, walk into the HEB and buy whatever you want. Um, you can also order stuff online uh, from their website. Um, they can deliver stuff from, uh, to your place or you can just go and uh, pick it up from the store, from their um, curbside. Um, so we have different types of market, but in general, um, market is any type of arrangement that bring uh, that brings the buyers and sellers together it allows them to exchange information see each other and uh, basically learn about each other um, in this market in this chapter sorry we're focused on um, one specific market which is called perfect competition what is this or competitive market what's so special about this market is that this market is huge we have tons of buyers and sellers in this market. Getting into this market is really, really easy. And getting out of it is also easy, meaning that if you have the money as a producer, as a seller, you can go into the market. If you make money, you can stay in the market. If you don't, you can easily leave the market. Most of the agricultural products um, belong to this market, okay? Uh, one buyer, one seller, alone they cannot change the price in the market but all the buyers and all the sellers in the market together as we will see can define the price and the market okay but one buyer um, cannot really impact the price or one seller cannot really influence the price in the market because the market is just too huge the type of product we have in this market basically is identical or similar uh, meaning that let's say you want to buy apples so apple is just apple i know we have different types but typically in this market the buyers go for the cheapest apple in the market so um, basically apple milk they're all similar they might be a little bit different for instance we might have um, customers who just want to buy organic product but they are a small fraction in this huge market okay but in terms of the type of products we see, the products are very, very similar. Um, so we are basically going to discuss about the demand and supply in this market, in this competitive market or perfect competition market, all right? And um, any market, um, basically has two sides. On one side, we have our buyers, us, customers, or demanders, and on the other side, we have supplier, producers, or sellers in the market. We are going to start with uh, demand side of the market because we're kind of all familiar with the demand. So we're going to define our demand. I'm going to show you the shape of the demand curve uh, we have, and then we will talk about the supply, which is kind of the steps that we take to build our supply. is very, very similar to demand. And then we're going to put the demand and supply together to define market equilibrium, okay? So let's just start with demand side of the market. Remember that there are so many factors that can impact um, your demand or your personal 
purchasing plans, basically, which is one way that we define demand. Um, it can be your income, it can be your uh, preferences, it can be um, the number of buyers in the market, it can be the quality of product that you are purchasing. So there's so many factors that can impact your purchasing plans as a buyer. But since we want to define demand, and remember in economics, we, we um, use lots of basically assumptions to build our economic model. So we're going actually to make a big assumption here. Uh, we're going to assume that the only factor for now that can change, that can impact your purchasing plans is the price, the price of the product. And then we want to basically use that by keeping the other factors that are um, impacting your purchasing plans fixed, define our demand, okay? So for now, the only thing that can impact your purchasing plans and the number of products that you purchase is the price of that product. Your income is fixed, your preferences are fixed, your, um, the, the number of buyers is fixed, the prices of other products that might impact your purchasing plans are all fix. Well, we'll talk about these other factors later, okay? So, um, so basically, if we are just looking here at the relationship between the price and the amount of goods and services that you purchase as a buyer, if we can figure out this relationship between price and the quantity of goods and services that you purchase, we can simply define our demand. I put, of course, a definition of demand here, but let me just show you what, what I mean by this definition. Okay, so remember other factors are fixed. The only thing that is impacting your purchasing plan is the price of the product. We are kind of familiar with this relationship that we're looking for between the price and how much you purchase. And by the way, we call this quantity of goods and services that we buy as a buyer quantity demanded. We like to kind of distinguish between these amount of goods and services that we buy as buyers with um, the quantity of goods and services that sellers sell. We call the first one quantity demanded and we call the second one quantity supplied. So we're gonna use this quantity demanded and quantity supplied a lot in this chapter. So get just used to it. So basically at this point, we're looking for the relationship between price and this quantity demanded, how much you buy as a buyer. We know, because we're all buyers, that if something is expensive, you are going to buy less. And when something becomes cheaper, you buy more. So let me just, um, let me just show you this example, okay? So let's say this is the market for bottled water. And if you look at the prices in the second column, you can see that as the price is going down from $2 to 50 cents, the number of bottled water that we are purchasing actually is going up. And you can also move backwards from 50 cents to $2. As the price is going up, the number of bottles we're buying actually is going down. So we were looking for the relationship between price and quantity demanded, one more time, quantity demanded is how much you purchase as a buyer, right? We found that relationship. Actually, we knew the relationship because we're all buyers, right? So there is an inverse relationship or a negative relationship between price and quantity demanded, right? That's how we are defining our demand. We're done. We, are, we were looking for the definition for demand, right? So demand shows the relationship between price and quantity demanded, which is an inverse relationship, right? When all the other factors like your income, your preferences, etc., they're all fixed, right? So there are two different ways that you can show this relationship between a price and quantity demanded. You can use the table as you can see in this slide on the left-hand side, or you can plug all these numbers on a graph and draw your uh, demand curve. That's another way of showing the relationship between price and quantity demanded, right? So 
when you want to draw your demand or your supply, remember that it's important where you're putting your price and your quantity, okay? Your quantity is always on the x-axis and the price is always on the y-axis, okay? And to draw our demand, basically we're going to find these combinations of price and quantity or we're going to basically find these points, points A through D. When you find these points, it's just like budget line that we drew in chapter one. It's just like PPC that we drew in chapter one. It's basically drawing a line that you probably remember from high school or middle school. So basically, uh, you find all these points, you connect them, the line that passes through all these points is your demand. But pay attention to the shape of the demand curve. Your demand curve is downward slope, showing one more time the relationship between price and quantity demand at one more time. When you move from A, point A, toward your point D, the price is going down on the y-axis while your quantity demanded is going up the x. Because again, we have this relationship, negative relationship between price and quantity demanded. We call this inverse relationship between these two law of demand, okay? So if on the test or homework, I'm asking you about law of demand, law of demand is nothing but this relationship between demand, no, sorry, quantity demanded and price. If price goes up, quantity demanded will go down. If price goes down, your quantity demanded will go up right? So the law of demand basically helps us understand the shape of demand, which is downward slope, okay? But remember, whenever we say demand or supply, we mean market demand or market supply. We're not talking about the demand for bottled water for one single person in this market. We're talking about the entire demand in the market or entire um, supply in the market. So market demand, we also have the similar definition for market supply, is when you put the demand for all the buyers in the market together, then you can have your market demand for each price, okay? So the easiest way that you can basically get your market demand and draw your market demand is if you add the quantity demanded of all the buyers in the market, again, quantity demanded was the amount of goods and services that buyers buy. So I buy one apple when the price is $1. You buy three apples when the price is $1. Uh, John purchases five apples when the price is $1. Because remember, we have different preferences. So if we add the quantity demanded of three of us at the price of one, now you have the market quantity demanded. And let's say it's just three of us in the market. That's going to be the market quantity demanded for us when the price is one. You can also ask me how much apple, how many apples you want to purchase when the price is, let's say two dollars then i'm gonna have an one uh, quantity demanded um you you're gonna have another quantity demanded johnny will have another quantity demanded right so you add the quantity demanded for all of us at price um then you have another market quantity demanded right so it's like just this example this is the market for corn you have three buyers at each price you can see that they are buying different amount of corns bushels of corn um, at each price if you add their quantity demanded you can get the market quantity demanded or the total quantity demanded right and if you look at the uh, bottom of this is like on the left, the very last graph, uh, which tells you the market demand is basically coming from the prices that we have for everybody. Remember, the price is the same for everyone in the market, right? When you go to HEB, the price of uh, one gallon milk is the same for everybody, right? It doesn't matter if your name is Joe, Jen, or Jay, you should all pay the same price, right? So the prices on the y-axis is the same for everybody in the last graph. And on the x-axis for the market um, demand, we're going to use numbers in the last column of this, um, of, on this slide, okay? Um, let's see. Um, I am basically talking about, let me find my, okay, here we go. So I'm basically talking about, I'm talking about this, I am talking about this column here. Oh, I can't write this. Hold on. Um, basically, I am talking about, oh, come on now. Hmm. Go back. 
talking about this column and I'm talking about this column, okay? So you put these prices here and then you use these quantities in here. That's the easiest way you can get uh, the market demand. So that is our market demand. Another way that you could actually draw this again, downward the slope market demand, the last graph we have at the bottom of the slide, is to use basically uh, the demand curve for all these buyers. It's pretty much the same thing. You are just going to add the quantity demanded for all these buyers each price and then put them here um, and then again you will end up with a downward slope market demand okay so we're gonna have the same thing for market supply all right so whenever we say market whenever we say demand we mean market demand same thing for supply all right so let me just remind you again one more time demand shows the relationship between between price demand shows the relationship between it's really hard to write here is the relation shows the relationship between price and quantity demanded p and q e which was an inverse relationship right law of demand also remember another way that we can define demand is that the demand shows how much our buyers are willing to pay for something so demand basically shows our willingness to pay that's another way that you can find demand you can write it down another definition that i use at the beginning is that the demand shows the purchasing plans of all the buyers in the market okay so three different ways of defining the same thing demand okay remember of course that um we um basically assumed so far that um all the factors that we are talking about here let's see um we just cleared the whole thing um remember that the um thing that we are basically using here assumption actually that we were using here is that that all the factors all the other factors that could impact your purchasing plan as a um as a buyer were fixed because price was super duper important uh, it's probably the one of the main thing that can impact your purchasing plans so as a result we were just focused on price to define our demand, right? But we know that there are so many other factors like the list that I'm showing you here that can impact your purchasing plans, like how much money you have. Remember we talked about budget, uh, your preferences. Do you like Apple or not? Uh, the number of buyers we have in the market. As we have more and more people in the market that want to buy Apple, the demand actually will go up, right? The price of related goods. You don't like Apple or you like Apple, but it's just expensive for you, but you have an alternative. Instead of apples, you purchase banana or you purchase oranges. So the price of related goods are also important for you and also expectations about future. Remember, whenever we talk about change in price, basically we are talking about jumping from one point to another point on the very same um, demand curve. Let me just go back to this graph here. So look at here. If the price changes from $1, uh, $1 to 1 1.5, you are going to move from point C to point B, but you are still on the very same demand, right? Because other factors are fixed, your price is changing, so you are just jumping from one point to another point. And the reason is that the quantity demanded is changing here. Your price is changing, your QD is going to change, right? But if we are talking about anything other than price, anything other than price, like all these factors that we call them determinants of demand, you are no longer on the very same demand curve 
In fact, we're going to shift our demand. What does it mean? It means that you are moving your demand, the entire demand curve, either to the right or to the left. You move your demand to the right when the demand is increasing and you shift your entire demand to the left when your demand is going down. And we have the same um, rule base basically for supply, okay? In here, when we're talking about changing demand or shifting demand or determinants of demand, we're going to make a big assumption. Here, we're going to assume price actually this time is fixed. So far, define our demand, we assume that these factors were fixed, right? And the only factor that was changing was price. But right now, since we're talking about other factors like these, we are going to make this assumption that the price is fixed, and then we'll see what's going to happen to demand. So if demand increases, we will look at some of the reasons that uh, the demand can increase. If demand increases, we're going to shift our entire demand to the right. And if our demand increase decreases, we're going to shift our demand leftward or to the left, left hand side of our original demand. Okay. That's what we mean by shifting. So for the test, if the question is asking you, okay, the price of Apple change in the market for Apple, what will happen? The demand is not going to shift. Your demand curve is not going to shift. Remember, you are just going to move along the very same demand from one point to another point. But if the question asks you, okay, the income of everybody in the economy went up, what's going to happen to your demand? Your demand, in fact, is going to shift. And see if, since people have more money to spend, the demand will increase. So you have a rightward shift in demand. It is not movement along because it's not about price, okay? So let's look at briefly all these factors very, very quickly. Oh, come on. Okay, uh, let me go back. All right, so this was exactly what I was talking about, the change in demand or shift in demand versus moving along, okay? So anything other than price, shift the demand, basically. That's the best way I can um, basically tell you and you can write it down. So if price changes, there's no shift, movement along the demand. But if anything other than price changes, there will be a shift, okay? Like your preferences, if you like something, you're going to buy more. So your demand for that product will increase. So you have a right to shift in demand and vice versa, okay? If you have more buyers in the market, the demand will increase, meaning that the demand will shift to the right. You have a rightward shift. If the number of per, uh, buyers decreases, the demand will decrease. So there will be a leftward shift in demand. Okay, income. Um, when it comes to income, we are we should talk about basically two different types of product we have. Okay, in economics. Um, that are related to income. We have so many different products in economics, but it would, which is related to income, I meant. We have normal goods. The majority of goods and services that we know are normal, okay? If you have more money, you are going to buy more normal goods. If you have more money, you're gonna buy more shoes. So, so shoes is a normal good. So if your income increases, your demand for normal good will shift to the right. If your income goes down, your demand for normal good will go down, will, will shift to the left, okay? But we also have another product which is called inferior goods. Inferior goods are those goods that actually your demand and your income for them, the demand for inferior goods and your income, um, move in the opposite direction. If your income increases, your demand for inferior good will go down. It will shift to the left and vice versa. Um, example, um, used clothing, used shoes, let's say, okay? So if your income increases, you're going to afford buying brand new shoes. So your demand for used shoes will go down. Make sense? Um, if your income goes down and you cannot afford buying a new brand new shoes, your demand for used shoes, one more time, will increase, right? Or um, bus rides, another example, we're not talking about if it's convenient or not for you to take a bus, um, but bus rides can be an inferior good because if you have more money, 
more income, you can uh, afford a car, right? Um, so you can basically um, see this decrease in the demand for bus rides, okay? Because bus ride is an inferior good. Remember, when we're looking at all these factors, these determinants of demand, again, uh, or maybe I forgot to mention it, we are assuming that we're just looking at one factor at a time. So when I'm talking about income, our preferences is fixed. The price was obviously fixed as I wrote it down for you. The number of buyers is fixed. It's just easier to focus on one factor at a time because if you change the income and preferences at the same same time, you really don't know the impact on demand right away, okay? So I'm just talking about changing income here. So all the other factors are fixed. We're, that's why I said in the bus ride example, we're not talking about your preferences because our assumption is that the preferences are fixed, okay? We're just focused on income and how the change in income can, can change your demand. Okay, makes sense, hopefully. Um, another factor was the price of related goods, like the apple oranges or apple banana example that I said. So by related goods, we mean the goods are either substitute or complementary. What does it mean? Um, substitute goods are those goods that can be replaced uh, one for another. So uh, chicken and turkey are substitute, tea and coffee are substitute. So if the price of tea changes, it will impact the demand for coffee because they are related, okay? So if, um, let's say, coffee becomes more expensive, the demand for tea as a substitute will go up. Again, I'm not talking about quantity demanded here. I'm talking about demand. I'm talking about two different markets here, okay? Um, if I was talking about the price of coffee, coffee and how many cups of coffee I purchased. Remember, I'm uh, talking about movement along the demand. There is no shift here. But right now in this example, I've changed it. I'm telling you the price of coffee is changing. What will happen to the demand for tea as a substitute? So something is changing in the market for coffee, but you'll see the impact in another market, tea. Makes sense? And we have complementary goods. Um, these are the goods that you always purchase or buy or eat together, um, like um, hot dog and hot dog bun, okay? Or coffee and cream. You never drink your coffee without cream. So if your coffee, one more time, becomes more expensive, Okay, your demand for cream will go down, right? Because they are related. They are complementary. And I apologize if you hear anything in the background. Um, um, the guy who cuts our grass actually is here, so it's pretty loud. So hopefully you won't hear it, but just in case you can, I apologize for that. It's just funny. Um, and most of the goods that we know, actually, they, they are not related, really. The last factor that we'll have, again, for the supply is expectations. Our expectations about future income, about future prices can impact our demand today. Remember, I talked about price of related good, but I talked about shifting in demand. And I told you about the coffee and cream example or coffee and tea example. So remember that I already told you if the price is changing, there is no shift. So what does it mean? If the price of coffee in the market for coffee changes, there is no shift. But if the price of coffee changes, but you are talking about the market for tea, there will be a shift. I also have another price here. It's about future prices here. So that's another price that can shift there is no movement along, okay? Future prices can shift the demand. Current prices, okay, cannot shift the demand, all right? I just want to be clear. So if you're expecting, let's go back to the expectations. I just wanted to clear this price kind of thing up because I always just get this, uh, get this question from my students that, oh, you talked about the price. Price, there is no shift. There are some shifts when it comes to price. If I'm talking about two different markets, substitute complementary goods, or if I'm talking about future prices. Okay, so be careful when you read the question, when you do the assignments. All right, expectations. If you're expecting that um, something that you want to purchase um, uh, will be more expensive in the future, you're not gonna wait till next month to buy it. And 
we have this assumption that money is not an issue for you. The preferences are fixed, right? So you're going to buy it. So your demand right now will go up. So let's say you want to buy a car, okay? And you're expecting that in summertime, the car that you want to purchase will be more expensive. And the assumption is that money is not an issue. So your demand for a car today, current demand will increase. It will move to the right, okay? But if you're expecting that there will be a huge discount, huge sale on the car that you want to purchase, um, next month, then you are um, going to wait, right? So your demand right now, your current demand will shift to the left, decrease in demand, okay? And same thing we have for future income, and it's a little bit tricky. Um, why? Because remember, we like to generalize things in economics, and you can definitely find some outliers here in my example. Uh, but again, we're, we like to generalize things, okay? So that's why I'm kind of careful with my wording here. So in general, if you're expecting that you will have, let's say, less income in the future because of recession, let's say, or because you want you are a full time you you want to become a full time student so you, so you really don't have that much time to work so your income actually is going to go down in the future so you start saving up right so you are not going to buy the car that you wanted to purchase right now so your demand for a car right now will go down will shift to the left because you're expecting that your income will go down in the future. Makes sense? I think we can all relate to this decrease in income. Now, listen to my um, increase in income in the future, okay? And that's the place that you can agree or disagree with me. In general, if you are expecting that you will have a huge increase in your income in the future, you're getting a better job, you have a big raise coming, um, you are graduating and you are getting a job, okay? Or you you were a full-time student, now you are a part-timer, so you can work more longer hours. So you're expecting to see a big income, big increase in your income. You are actually, you don't have the money right now, but in general, your demand for that car you want to purchase will go up right now because you know you can pay off your bills you're going to use your credit card, you're going to borrow the money, you are going to get a loan or whatever, but you know you can pay it off in the future, so you're going to spend that money. You are going to increase your demand today. This is, again, in general. If you want to ask my opinion, you should wait till you get your first paycheck, and then you can go ahead and purchase that car. But again, in general, if you are expecting that your income will go up in the future, your demand for a car that you wanted to purchase right now will increase. But again, you can agree or disagree. But remember, we go with this in general thing that I, that I was talking about. All right. So these are the five important factors that can impact our demand, that can shift our demand. So if the price changes, remember, there is no shift. The price of Apple in the market for Apple, of course, or coffee example that I gave you. If anything other than price changes, however, there will be a shift like your income, like your preferences. Okay. Uh, the number of buyers expectations. All right. Hopefully, we're fine with demand. Let's move on to the supply. And I try to kind of be faster in supply because the steps that we take to define supply is very dissimilar to demand. Now think about as a producer and to understand supply, I always tell my students that it's better if you forget about demand side of the market because it makes it a little bit confusing, all right? So for now, you are a producer, okay? To define supply, just like demand, we're going to assume that the important factor that can impact your selling plans as a seller, as a producer, um, 
um, is price, okay? So we want to figure out the relationship between price and how many goods and services you sell. Remember, we called it quantity supply. So if we figure out the relationship between price and quantity supply, then we are good to go. Then we can define our price. Remember, as a producer, you think about your profit, right? So if the price of the product that you are selling in the market for any reason that we don't care right now is going up and you are a greedy producer looking for maximizing your profit and this QS stands for quantity supplied, you are actually going to sell more. You are going to increase the quantity supplied of your product in the market because profit will be huge. Everybody loves your product probably. That's one of the reasons that your price actually is going up in the market. And remember that profit in general is Equal, this is my equal sign, okay, is your revenue, your total revenue, revenue minus your cost, okay? And revenue is nothing but, okay, cost is, your revenue is price times times quantity supplied, how much you sell in the market, okay? So if price is increasing in the market for your product, you are actually better off by selling more because if your the cost is fixed, let's say for now, price times quantity supplied will go up, right? Significantly you can double your profit here. And if the price goes down, I'm not gonna write it down, but if the price goes down, the quantity supplied will go down. You are going to sell less. It's not beneficial for you. It's not profitable for you. You are gonna wait for the right price in the market, okay? So we had an inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded for demand, right? But here we have a positive relationship. Oh, let me just write it down, I changed my mind. Positive relationship between, I'm gonna write it here, positive relationship between price and quantity supply. We move price and quantity supply in the same direction. Again, let me remind you, quantity supply is how much the sellers are gonna sell in the market, how much producers are going to produce, okay? So price and quantity supply move in the same direction. There's a positive relationship between these two. So we found that relationship between price and quantity supply, right? So the supply shows the relationship between between price and quantity supply, when other factors that can impact your producing plans, your selling plans are fixed, like again, expectation, the cost of production for you, um, the number of uh, competitors or sellers you have in the market, these all factors are fixed, just like demand. Remember, we're making this assumption to define our supply for now. And we already defined it because supply shows the relationship between price and quantity supplied, and we found that relationship, okay? So, supply shows the relationship between price and quantity supply, or we can say that supply shows the selling plans of all the producers, or we can say that supply shows the cost of production, different ways that we can define supply. We had a downward slope demand, but if you look at the shape of the supply in this um, slide, you can see that supply is upward slope. Again, we put the supply, sorry, we put the price here, on the, we put the supply, I said, keep saying supply. We put the price here. We put the quantity here. We basically found this combination of price and quantity supply. Connect them, then you have a upward slope um, supply. However, let me put it next to demand. However, this was the shape of our demand. We had price here, and we had quantity demanded here. This is quantity supplied here for supply. Okay.
So our supply is upward slope, our demand is downward slope. We have a downward slope because of law of demand, which was an inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. We have an upward slope supply because of law of supply, which is about the, inver the positive sorry, uh, relationship between price and quantity supplied, okay? Um, just like demand, now let's talk about the determinants of supply quickly. These are the factors that can shift market supply. I'm going to skip it. It's very similar to demand. So if price changes, we're going to move from one point to another point on the very same supply. If anything other than supply changes, however, like these factors, price of resources, technology, taxes, tax subsidies, expectations about future and the number of sellers in the market, the supply uh, will shift. Supply actually will increase if the supply, sorry, if the supply increases, and there will be again a rightward shift in supply. And if the supply decreases, we have a leftward shift. Our supply will shift to the left. Okay. And again, think about all these factors and how they can impact um, impact your um, selling plans, okay, and your cost of production okay because you are a producer here um let me just show you quickly price of resources if um the if the cost of production for you uh if the price of the raw materials that you purchase if the um, rent you pay the wages you pay to your workers increases it means that the cost is going up so your supply will go down like right so it's costly for you and vice versa if you have a good technology for your workplace you can save money you can reduce the cost so you are able again to supply more during recession times however um there's no technology improvement so typically the supply decreases. Taxes and subsidies are exactly the opposite of each other. Um, if taxes of any type actually increases, again, the cost for you as a producer will go up, so you supply less. Um, if, if there is a tax cut, however, your supply will go up because the cost is going down. If you are eligible to receive any subsidies from the government, which is kind of extra money that the government, free money that the government gives you, then you are actually able to reduce your cost and supply more. If you lose that subsidy, the supply will go down. All right. Um, your expectations about future is very similar to demand. I'm going to skip it. Number of sellers, very similar to number of demanders in the demand section. Very, very similar. Okay. Now for us, it's time to put demand and supply together to define our market equilibrium. Remember we talked about different prices for demand when we were drawing our demand curve, we had different prices for supply when we were drawing our supply. But when you go to HEB to purchase an, uh, a pound of apple, there's just one price, okay? Remember that price is coming from this market equilibrium we're defining here. Market equilibrium is coming from the intersection of our demand curve and our supply curve. It's a stable place where there is a balance between the purchasing plans of all the buyers and the selling plans of all the sellers, okay? At the equilibrium, there is one single price in the market we call it equilibrium price and there is one single quantity that we call it equilibrium quantity okay if you go to HEB and the price for one pound of apple is 1.5 dollars that is the equilibrium price it's coming from both sides of the market both sides of the market buyers and sellers kind of indirectly without speaking they pick that price. That's the price that both sides of the market agreed on. It might be expensive for you, but remember, you are one single buyer in the market. If you don't buy it, your um, 
purchasing uh, plans or your behavior in the market cannot really impact the price. But if all the buyers in the market find that $1.5 expensive, then you are signaling the market, oh, okay, it's too expensive. We're not gonna buy that much uh, uh, Apple at that price, okay? It's just too expensive. So now all of us, all the buyers are, uh, are finding this price expensive. So all of us together can actually change the price, all right? Let me show you the shape of the market equilibrium. So the market equilibrium is coming from, this is a downward slope demand, this is upward slope supply. So the intersection of our demand and supply, right this point here, right here, is our market equilibrium. Oops, what happened? This point right here, trying to, this point here, the intersection of demand and supply is our market equilibrium, okay? We have an equilibrium price, $3, our equilibrium quantity, $7. So when the price is $3, the quantity in the market is seven. And if you pay attention, we have a price here and we have a Q here. I'm not calling it QD or QS because at the equilibrium, QS is the same as QD, right? They are the same. That's very important. At the equilibrium, or this is equal, equal sign, um, a quantity supplied, how much the buyer sell is the same as how much supplier sell in the market. Okay. Um, sometimes we are not at the equilibrium. Uh, let's say when the price is two dollars. Okay, at the price of two, we say we have shortage in the market. So basically, anytime the price is a uh, is sorry is below the equilibrium price, we say that we have shortage in the market. And the reason for that is because let me change the color. And the reason for that is because. Um, when the price is two dollars our quantity demanded is greater than quantity supply meaning that many buyers want to take advantage of this low price because typically the price is three dollars that's the equilibrium price or the market price right right now the price is two so the quantity demanded is greater than quantity supply but we do not have enough product enough corn in this example in the market as soon as we have shortage in the market the price will increase okay so whenever we have shortage the market actually will change the price the price eventually will increase when we are back to the equilibrium because that's the stable place okay and if the price is somewhere here above the equilibrium price let's say $4 uh, we are, we're going to end up with surplus in the market and the reason is that the price is just too high for everybody for buyers so find actually this price pretty high so the quantity demanded well, less than quantity supply. This price is in favor of the producers, not the buyers. So that's why we have a surplus of corn because people don't want to purchase the corn at this price. Um, so we have too much corn. We have excess su uh, supply of corn in the market. Um, to go back to the equilibrium, the price should go down. So every time that we have shortage, price will go up and whenever we have surplus, the price should go down because we love to be at the equilibrium, okay? Um, I am not going to spend that much time talking about this part because I have a separate video talking about shifting and I actually like that video a lot because I drew um, all the graphs for you, but I just want you um, to look it over quickly. Um, remember that in, the, in real life, um, demand and supply are changing constantly they are shifting constantly with every single news that you hear that you might think that they are insignificant there is a change um, in the market there is a reaction into the market coming from either uh, buyers or producers in the market so constantly the demand and supply are shifting but remember in terms of our um, our course material and this chapter 
we always want to find how the events, how the news can change our demand and supply. Are these events uh, increasing our demand, shifting our demand to the right or to the left? How about the supply? Are they impacting the supply at all? Um, we want to find new equilibrium. We always want to find new equilibrium price, new equilibrium quantity. So we have different cases here. And um, for this part, I always tell my students that try to learn to draw graphs. You can, of course, memorize um, what's going to happen if, let's say, like this example, demand increases. What will happen to the price and quantity? They are both going to go up. But try to understand why the price and quantity are both increasing and try to understand them by drawing graph. You don't want to just rely on your memories, especially at the time of the test when there are lots of things that you need to remember, okay? So look at my separate videos that you can find them on D12 for this part where we're shifting the demand and supply. First, we are just shifting the demand, keeping the supply fixed. Then we shift the supply, we keep the demand fixed. And then look at the complex cases where we're shifting the demand and supply at the same time, which is more realistic in terms of the real life examples. If there is a change in demand, there would be a response to that supply, to, to that um, demand in terms of the supply, okay? Um, or if the supply changes, the demand will change. Demand and supply um, both change in the market, sometimes with a little bit of a lag, but definitely, if there is a change in demand, there will be a change in supply and vice versa. That's why complex cases are more realistic compared to the previous cases where we're just assuming that supply is completely fixed and it's not changing or when the demand is fixed, it's not changing. Okay. And here um, you will see that we call them complex cases. Let me show you table we have here and this could be a good way for you to understand to take notes not understand just to take notes or this, this can be your um, kind of cheat sheet <laughs> um, where it summarizes these complex cases as you can see here for the complex cases when demand and supply change at the same time if you don't know how much demand and supply are changing you are not able to tell what exactly going to happen to your quantity or your price okay that's why we call them complex cases if you know there exactly how much demand and supply are changing you can tell for instance look at the first line supply is increasing demand is decreasing your price for sure will go down and of course the reason for it as a side note is because of the demand because the demand is very very powerful and typically the demand tells us what's going to happen to price just keep it in mind uh, but the change in equilibrium uh, sorry equilibrium quantity is unknown uh, the quantity can go up can go down or can remain the same in this case because the the in this table you cannot really tell how much your supply is going up is the increase in so in supply is greater or smaller or the same as the decrease in demand you don't know that's why you cannot tell much about the change in quantity here okay so take a look at that um those videos that i'm talking about i tried to them down. Uh, let me briefly talk about the last topic in this um, chapter and we're done. Um, it's called price control. So uh, we talked about market equilibrium. Um, we talked about equilibrium price, equilibrium quantity. Remember that sometimes the government um, feels like that the uh, market price or this equilibrium price is just too high or too low for buyers, for households, for workers, for producers. As a result, the government intervenes in the market and kind of uh, changes the price in the market, okay? If the government feels like that the price in the market is just too high for our um, households, for our uh, buyers, let's say, then the government tries to change that price for those groups of uh, buyers in the market. The best example for price ceiling is rent control. Let's say we're talking about New York City or San Francisco where housing is really, really expensive. So the government comes up with this plan that is called rent control, which is price ceiling. The government feels like that the current rent in the market is just too high for some of the low-income families. Look at this graph. 
So the government sets the price below the equilibrium price, okay? To help these um, households out. So the current price, let's say, is 3.5. I know it doesn't match with the rent control that I'm talking about, but these are just imaginary numbers. The government feels like this 3.5 is high, so the government offers a price ceiling, which is $3, okay? So the price is below the equilibrium price, it's more affordable for some of the households, low income households, if again, we go back to the rent control, but it causes a problem because we'll learn that whenever the price is below the equilibrium price, quantity demand will be greater than quantity supply, so we will end up with shortage. So we will have some households that cannot get their rent control apartments, housing, because we have so many people who want to get the rent at the low price of price ceiling, but we do not have enough apartments for everybody. Makes sense? So we have a shortage of housing here in this example. But remember, as long as we have this rent control program, we will have some shortage. That's the direct impact of uh, rent control program. Um, it, it causes a shortage in the market. And we're not trying to fix it here, okay? The goal, remember, the goal here is to support and provide affordable housing for some households, but it creates a problem shortage. We also have a uh, black market here, as another kind of um, a result of uh, the price uh, ceiling, because uh, there will be a black market along with the legal market, uh, because th there are some households who might be willing to pay a little bit more than the price ceiling, and there are some, um, let's say, landlords who are willing to accept that money. So so we will also have the black market. So how effective the rent control is, I don't know. We're not talking about the, um, the about that or the fairness about the program or whatnot. I'm just trying to show you what it means uh, to have a price ceiling. Sometimes the government feels like that's another discussion we can have. Um, another um, uh, uh, price control we have is when the government feels like that the price in the market or the equilibrium price is too low, like minimum wage, you probably heard about minimum wage, um, or for some of the agricultural products, sometimes the price is just too low or not profitable for farmers. So the government tries to um, offer the price uh, floor, um, minimum wage in the case of the labor market. Um, so this time the price is too low equilibrium. So uh, the wage rate, let's say, in the market is just too low for some group of workers. So the government sets the price above a equilibrium price. Instead of the price of $2, the price, um, uh, the price uh, floor uh, will be, let's say, $3, right? So it is a little bit higher. So it's going to help out some of the workers. But we, again, learned that if the price is above the equilibrium price, we will have surplus because quantity supplied will be greater than um, quantity demanded. Okay. Um, in the uh, example of minimum wage, the quantity supplied actually are the workers. They're the suppliers in the market because you are offering or supplying your um, skills, right? Your time. So you are the supplier in this example of the uh, labor market or the minimum wage. Um, so you want to get that those jobs with the minimum wage, but you do not have uh, well, we do not have enough um, basically positions or jobs um, that are uh, that kind of matches with this program. So we will have a surplus of workers here, which is unemployment. All right, um, but again, we're not trying to fix anything here. And just one side note that I always tell my students. The surplus that I'm talking about in the labor market, you cannot really blame um, the minimum wage for whatever unemployment rate is officially in the country. Tiny, very small fraction of that unemployment rate is coming from the minimum wage. And of course, there's always this topic that, okay, should we increase the minimum wage or not? Um, and the answer, in my opinion, is it really depends on the cost of living. And remember that if you increase this minimum wage, look, just imagine what's going to happen to the um, surplus. Um, so let's say I put the price here. Okay, let's say we increase it price of four. Um, and look what's going to happen to the surplus or the number of people who cannot get these jobs. So the surplus will go up, right? It means that, first of all, um, the number of people who want to take these jobs will go up, but at the same time, the number of people who are offering these jobs, um, who are our employers, actually will go down. So less number of 
um, employers are willing to pay that uh, $4, right? So what's going to happen, um, unemployment rate will go up. Um, the cost is going to go up for our employers because they are going to pay more instead of paying $2 or $3, they have to pay $4 now per hour. Um, so if their costs go up, they are going to increase the price of their products for everybody in the economy because they have to make money, right? The cost is going up. Remember, profit is revenue minus cost. So their cost is going to go up. So in to to increase their profit or keep their profit as it is, they have to increase their price, right? So that's why um, if you think about it, economically speaking, again, I'm not talking about um, fairness here. Economically speaking, increasing minimum wage is not a good thing because it will increase inflation, all right? Because everything will be more expensive. But if you look at the minimum wage and you kind of compare it with the cost of living in a city that you're living in, um, you might find it that is too low. Then it makes sense for the government to increase the minimum wage. For instance, for the state of Texas, the government didn't change the minimum wage for a very long time. So maybe we are due for, um, for a tiny bit of increase in the minimum wage. But if you increase it, like let's say from it's, it's, um, uh, it's 7.25 right now, and let's say you increase it to $15 per hour. That's a huge jump, right? So you will see this inflation, right? So just, just, just think about it again. I'm not talking about fairness, economically speaking. All right, all right. Um, that's it for chapter three. I will see you soon, and hopefully you find this video helpful.